الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم Alhamdulillah, as Sister Yasmin was saying, the past two days we've been journeying in the seas of Adab. Starting from Adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Adab with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Adab with others, and it would only be fitting to finish this journey by looking at Adab with our nafs, or Adab with ourselves. And when you put the effort to nurture, replenish, and self-regulate your nafs, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to, you will be able to overflow into all the empty cups around you. The adab of your nafs will affect those surrounding you without you realizing, without you having to put any effort, because it becomes a part of you. It becomes who you are. So before we jump into exploring adab with our nafs, we have to look deeper into the nafs itself, right? and familiarize ourselves with what we're actually dealing with. Nafs is an Arabic word, of course, we all know that, obvious, which literally means self, right? And has also been tra translated into psyche, ego, soul. It has been mentioned in the Quran in two different ways. Once as an individualistic way, and once collective. The individualistic um, sense in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 48, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا لَا تَجْزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ شَيْئًا And fear a day when no soul will suffice for another soul at all. And the collective sense is in Surah Al-Nisa, verse 1, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا O mankind, fear your Lord who created you from one soul. Which points out that despite the fact that humanity is banded together in having the same positive qualities of the nafs, each and every one of us is going to be responsible for what they choose under what free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you have believed, Upon you is responsibility for yourselves. Those who have gone astray will not harm you when you have been guided. Yes, we all came from the same origin, the same nafs, but we're all accountable for our choices. So quickly, and I'm sure you guys all know this, but I'll just quickly kind of go over this. The types of anfus, right? The Quran mentions how many? <coughs> Three types of anfus, right? And I'm going to add one at the end. So the first nafs we all know is what a nafs of Ammar of right? The one that commands you with evil. It basically overrules you. It doesn't know how to say no to anything. You know like a spoiled kid who has parents who are like spoiling him and I want this, okay, and I want this, okay, but it's bad for your child. No, 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 he's going to be upset, just give it to him. No tarbiyah whatsoever, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this type of nafs where in Surah Yusuf, when the wife of the Aziz says what? And I do not acquit myself. Indeed, the soul is a persistent enjoiner of evil. I'm not going to say I'm innocent. The thing that has stripped me of my hayat and brought me to the slowest of places is my nafs, right? I listened to it, I didn't control it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jathiyah, have you seen he who has taken his own desire as his God? You worship your own nafs, you listen to what it tells you. You don't stop it, you don't hold it to account. And as I'm listening to the Anfus, please, I'm going to ask you to really think about your nafs, right? And expose yourself to this and try to be honest with yourself and define what kind of nafs do I have, right? Or am I swinging back and forth between one nafs and the other? The best thing you can do is to be honest with yourself. You know yourself the best. The next step of nafs is the nafs in the well. The nafs that reproaches itself. It feels bad, it feels guilt. It's the nafs that once it errs out of the normal, right? Because we're human beings, we make mistakes, it's perfectly fine. It feels bad right away, and it feels ashamed or embarrassed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by this type of nafs. لا أقسم بيوم القيامة I swear by the day of resurrection. وَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالنَّفْسِ اللَّوَّامَةِ 
and I swear by the reproaching soul. But why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swear by the day of judgment? Then this type of soul. How are they connected? It's because this type of soul changes from nafs amara basu, right? Or from nafs lawama to even nafs mutma'inna when it is reminded by what? By the day of judgment. When it's reminded that it's going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be held accountable. The third type of nafs is a nafs al mutma'inna. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all grant us all what? Anfus mutma'inna. The content, serene, reassured soul. And why is it called so? Because all the souls around it are at unrest, trying to figure out how to reach the state, but they're usually looking in the wrong direction. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What ya ayyatun al nafsun mukma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatun mardiyya. O righteous soul, or assured soul, what return to your Lord, well pleased and pleasing to Him. So these are the three types of anfus that are mentioned in the Qur'an. <clears throat> but that's not it. There is a fourth type, which I think is the most dangerous type of nafs. It's a nafs al-ghafila. The nafs that is heedless. It's not doing bad, but it's not doing good either. It's literally living without a purpose. Like animals or cattle. I wake up, what do they do? They graze, sleep, reproduce, graze, sleep, reproduce, and then they die, and that's it. I wake up, I eat, I go to school, I come back, eat, study, go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, repeat, repeat. No purpose in life whatsoever. It's like literally someone who's daydreaming. Someone who's not paying attention to why they're here or what their purpose of existence is. And it could be someone who's very decent, by the way. I'm not saying it's someone. It could be someone who's decent, someone who's respectful and kind and all, but simply living with no purpose. And repenting from that type of nafs actually could be harder than the nafs what al amar al su, the one that orders you to do bad. Why? Because this nafs thinks it's what? It's doing great. And nafs al amara or one when they sin, after a while, what happens? You get disgusted by the sin you're in. You feel bad. You don't feel well. You do whatever you're doing, but then afterwards you don't feel right. After a while, you're sick and tired of what you're doing. But the nafs al-ghafila thinks it's great. And if it's going to sin, actually shaitan himself might stop it from sinning. Because if it sins, it might be the wake-up call for this nafs. So it lets it be, right? And this type of nafs usually wakes up when? When it's on its deathbed. When it realizes, wait a minute. Just living like this wasn't good enough. What have I been doing? I should have had a purpose. I should have had to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scary thing in our time today, guys, is that the majority of people are neither disowned, they're not like doing fahsha, like terrible sins, neither are they are that. They're not worshippers. The majority of us or our nation right now is in ghafla. We are ghafleen. And that is very, very scary. Now, we know the four types of anfus. Do you know which type of nafs you are? I'm not going to hold anybody anymore. I'm not going to embarrass you. <laughs> but everybody by now should know what type of a nafs they have. And this is going to help you really pinpoint what you really need to work on as I go through the tarbiyah of the nafs, or the steps that we can what? Purify our anfus, right? And have adab of our nafs. You might say, I have such nafs, so I need to maybe work on repentance. Or I have this type of nafs, so I need to work more on self-restraint, and so on and so forth. Okay? Agreed? Alright, we all know what type of anfus we have. Or nafs or anfus, it could be one or more as we said. And it's a really, extremely <coughs> important to attain these adab. You as a human being, as a Muslim, you have to be well balanced. Your mind, your body, your soul all have to work together what? Like, like this, right? You can't have one part here and the other part there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you your body, your mind, and your soul as an amana, And you'll be questioned about it and asked about it. So this brings us to the understanding that the key to our success and happiness in this dunya and in the akhirah is our nafs and how we discipline it, how we purify it, and how we refrain from anything that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from actions or utterances. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ فَلَاحَ Success. The one who purifies his soul has what? Been successful. 
وقد خاب من دسها. And he has failed the one who instills it with corruption. What are you doing with your nafs? Are you doing tazkiyah or are you filling it with things that displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Every one of my ummah will enter Jannah except those who refuse. What do you mean? Refuse? Like who would come to Jannah and say, no, I don't feel like going in. Like, come on. So they asked Rasulullah, who would refuse to go to Jannah? He said, whoever obeys me shall enter Jannah. And whoever disobeys me has refused. Man ata'ani dakhala al-jannah wa man asani faqad adha. So when you refuse to follow the guidelines of adab with your nafs, you're refusing to enter Jannah, subhanAllah. And also Sayyidina Muhammad says, this is a really serious um, hadith. Every person starts his day as a vendor of his soul, either freeing it or causing its ruin and destruction. That's why, as a Muslim, you should be in a consistent state of disciplining your nafs and purifying it and cleansing it and refraining from anything that might corrupt it and holding it to account on a daily basis, not once in a blue moon or when something tragic happens in your life and wakes you up. Every single day, hold yourself to account. Okay, beautiful. But how do I do this? I need practical steps, right? I'm talking to, so what, what do I do now? I need something, a game plan that I can go home and say, I'm going to work on this. So step number one, in Tasqeet and Nafs, or purifying your soul. The first step is what? Tawbah, repentance, right? I do something bad. Don't do something bad. I'm just saying, if you do something bad, right? The first thing you do is what? You feel guilty. It doesn't feel well. And that's a good sign. It means that you have a living heart. A heart that is awake, right? I feel bad. And then, what do I do? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. If somebody else is part of this, you know, in this mistake that I did, I fix the wrong that I did, and then I intend not to that, do that sin again. But put to mind, it's very possible that you will do the same sin again if it's something that you're struggling with with your nafs. If it's a behavior in you, what are you going to do? You might do it again. You're not intending to do it again, but you might keep repeating the same sin. And shaitan most likely will show up here and tell you, you did the same thing again. You really think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you again. Just stop. Don't even bother. It's too late. Don't ever, ever let shaitan make you think that way. And Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, says, and a beautiful, I love this hadith, right? I'm not telling you, not encouraging you to do anything bad, but if you have something you're struggling with and you sometimes feel like it's pointless, I just keep repeating it, listen to this hadith. Sayyidina Muhammad says, Allah is more pleased with the repentance of his believing servant than a person who loses his riding beast, the animal he's what, riding, with all carrying his food and provision. He sleeps feeling disappointed of its recovery and then gets up and goes in search for it until he's hit by thirst. So he turns back to the main place he was and puts his head between his hands, waiting for death. Oh, he's in the desert, he's going to die. His ride or his beast is gone with the food and the drink. And when he wakes up, he finds his beast with the food and the provision in front of him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more pleased with the repentance of his servant then the recovery of this beast along with the provisions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. He's telling us just repent. I won't just accept it, I will be pleased with you. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even need us guys? He's not in need of us, but he's telling you just repent. I will be pleased with your repentance. Don't give up, don't let shaitan make you give up on your nafs. He created us subhanAllah. And when you create something or make something, it becomes dear to you, right? He wants you to be in the best state and form. And subhanAllah, I, I remember something that, you know, about when you do something with, with your hand or you make something, how dear it becomes to you. I remember I think I was maybe 10 years old or 11. This was back in Zimbabwe. I grew up there. And we were, I think it was around maybe, I don't know, there was some, I don't know, it was Mother's Day or something. Something was going on. And they had somebody come from outside, it was a pottery professional. 
and we had to make these little clay pots as a gift for someone special. And I wanted to make it for my mom. And I spent so much time as a little kid, right, and learning how to put it together, and then they took it away, and it was a secret. We didn't tell our parents. They took it, and then they baked it in their ovens, and they bought it back next week, and then we had to prime it, and then wait for it to dry, and then after that, we had to paint it. I remember putting all these like pretty little red bows, and I wrote mom on it, and, and then we had to wait for it to dry, and then glaze it, and I'm like, so excited, and I took it like very secretly, you know, you know, hoping my mom won't find it, because you know how our moms are, they, they, they seem, you can't hide anything from them in the house, right? And I hid it somewhere, and then I waited when everybody was there, and I went, and I remember trying to grab it, and it fell down and shattered. And exactly, I was like, what? But there was a lot of tears with that. I was bawling out my eyes. I was like, oh my god. And I was like, my mom didn't understand. I was like, I couldn't talk. You know, I was like, oh, you know. And subhanAllah, whenever I think of that, and this is something silly, it's like a little, you know, it was all mushed up and whatever. But when I think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, the Lahmat al A'la, and He created us. How could He not love us? How could He not want the best for us? How could He not want us to go to Jannah? And He's telling you, repent, and I will forgive you. Not just that. Repentance erases whatever was in that book. It's gone. No one will know of it. We just forget. Right now, say, Allahumma inni asnaqtuluku wa atubu ilayhi. For everything that I remember and everything that I don't remember, Ya Rabbi. Right now, go ahead. Just a second. Ya Allah, I ask for repentance for everything I recall and everything I don't recall, Ya Rabbi. Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ameen. And Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says what? Or actually Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says what? وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Turn to Allah in repentance so that you might succeed. And Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? I seek repentance from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala a hundred times. Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who does not speak out of his own how or inclination Ask for repentance a hundred times. How about us? How many istighfars and ask for repentance do we do a day? A hundred? And when we're doing it, how are we doing it? Are we checking off boxes? Okay, okay, check, done. Allah says, Muhammad, okay, a hundred times, check. Alhamdulillah, a hundred times. Are we really thinking about what we are saying? What we're asking for forgiveness from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We've become so concerned about the quantity and not the quality. I said this stuff about a hundred times, okay, done. But did it really change my heart? Did I feel the difference? Did I feel my nafs changing? Did it open up my heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's light when it comes it can actually land in there? Or am I just checking off boxes to make myself feel good about it? And subhanAllah, the way we should be doing is this. I recap my day. Okay, first thing in the morning. With my parents, let me quickly recap, did I do anything? Okay, did I see something? Okay, wait a minute, I did something. Okay, check. Now that's that's really a check. Okay, now on my commute, did I look at the thing I wasn't supposed to look at? Or did I react in a way I wasn't supposed to? Okay, Allah my suffer to be like, that's another check. That's the way you need to do istighfar. Recap your day at home, at my commute, at school, in college, wherever it is that I'm going and carrying myself. And subhanAllah, as you are doing tawbah, you are actually disciplining yourself, humbling your nafs because you're confronting it with its mistakes. Nobody likes to say I'm wrong, right? That's how we are, even with little kids. You just like, no, I didn't. I'm like, no, no, you just, no, I didn't, right? We're stubborn. <laughs> We're human, subhanAllah, our nafs sometimes is just so stubborn. That's the way you need to discipline yourself, to basically make it apologize. Allahumma inni astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi. You see what I'm saying? So that's the first thing you need to do. Tawbah. Okay, number two, next practical thing you need to do, Self-monitoring, adab muraqabat nafs And I'm going to simplify it to you. If I come and tell you right now, for the next month or so, I'm going to have two cameramen who are going to be documenting every single step of your day. What's going to happen? The duck faces are going to come out of yours, right? <laughs> what do you guys call them? Duck faces here? We call them in the state duck faces, and I hate those. I don't even know why it's called the duck face. But anyway, honestly, what's going to happen? I'll tell you, you are going to be on immaculate behavior. Perfection at its best because the camera is rolling. Because the people are watching. Right? But what if you put into mind, it's not all the people. It's not just me. But it's the creator of you 
and those people that is watching us 24-7. How are your actions going to be affected by that? You can't hide. There's nowhere to go. You live on this earth, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You breathe this air. You live off his sustenance and his provision. Where are you going to go? When your nest suggests a certain action, will you stop it and say, but how can I? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. Or you're going to say, well, it's my time. Or I'm somewhere where nobody really knows me. And just go ahead and follow your nafs and let it take you and lead you to whatever it wants to take you to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا Indeed, Allah is ever over you an observer. He is watching us night and day. And when Junaid was asked on the matter of lowering one's gaze, right? And what helps him in practicing that? It's very easy now. SubhanAllah, even if we are, you know, very observant of what we do when we look with others, when we're on the street, sometimes things are just like, it's in your face. You don't know where to go. I'm like, where do I go? Where do I go? Like, sometimes I'm at the mall with my kids and I'm like, the, the, the stores, the things they have, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, don't look, don't look this way, don't look this way. Like, where do, where do I make them look? SubhanAllah. So he was asked, what do I do to practice lowering my gaze? He said, he replied, by knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's look to you is faster than your look to the person you're about to gaze upon. Before I even lift my eye, Allah's look to me is going to be faster. And the Prophet said, Ihsan is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see Him. And if you do not achieve that state of devotion, take it for granted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you. Allah sees us. And that's the second way of discipline your nafs. Muraqabat al nafs, self monitoring. Now, the third one, number three, we said what? Repentance, and then what? Self monitoring. Allah is watching me. Adab muhasabat al nafs, self accounting. And Allah, if you print this hadith and put it somewhere where you look a lot, girls, I'm sure you always look at the mirror to fix your hijabs, and boys, I don't know if you look at anything or not, but whatever, your phones maybe. <laughs> put on your screensaver, something like that, or your computer. Ala inna sil'atullahi ghaliya. Ala inna sil'atullahi ghaliya. Truly Allah's goods are precious. Truly Allah's goods are but jannah. If you think about it, when there is something that's really expensive that you want to buy, really, really want it, it's quite pricey, what are you going to do? Your parents are not going to give you the money, right? And you're still in school. What are you going to start doing? You're going to start saving up. And you're going to start sacrificing the things that you really like to do or buy because you want this thing. And the same concept. If you want the jannah التي فيها ما لا عين رأت if you want Jannah where there will be bounties which no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has ever perceived, you are going to have to save and you're going to have to sacrifice. Not everything your nafs tells you to do, you're going to have to do. You're going to have to put your foot down and say, no. And not just that. You're going to have to think like a businessman or a businesswoman. And you're going to have to have a business plan, like a, a work plan. And you're going to have to stick to it in order to succeed and reach that goal. <coughs> My goal is Jannah. Jannah's over there. And I'm going to have to take a certain path to reach it. And it's not necessarily going to be the easiest path, or the fanciest, or the most decorative, or the most comfortable path, right? And there are going to be a lot of distractions. Things will pull me to the right, and things will pull me to the left. But I have to be smart. Even if I get pulled right and left, I have to get myself back on track as fast as I can, back onto the path with the least amount of distractions. Do you guys know the game Subway Surf? Yeah? You know that little guy jumping over things and under things and you know, collecting as many coins as he can, not bumping into these you know, obstacles and like dying? Same concept. I'm trying to get there, over things, under things, collecting as many good deeds as I can without being obstructed by something that makes me stop where I am. Remember Subway Surf, okay? Don't forget. You start your day with the same intention, that whatever you do that day is going to be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And deal with every little interaction, don't, don't undermine anything, every little interaction in your day as a chance that might either increase or decrease your bank account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think like a businessman, businesswoman. I have to gain or loss, that's the way it is, this dunya. 
Am I going to gain or am I going to lose? Every interaction. Am I adding to my account or am I taking away from my account? Okay. Let's start from the beginning of the day. My salah, is it on time or not? My daily wood, my adhkar, my duties towards my parents. Those that I deal with, strangers at the store. Everything is a chance for you to add to your account or to take away from it. What am I going to choose as I deal with each one of them? Am I going to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do? Or am I going to listen to my nafs and God forbid become what? Bankrupt. And this brings us to what? Holding yourself to account every day before you go to sleep. Just carve out a little time, even well, like five minutes. You don't have to do like half an hour where it's something becomes impossible to do, right? Five minutes at the end of each day, or when you're on your pillow at night, and start with yourself. And ask yourself, has my account today and ask yourself, has my account today increased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or has it decreased? Wait a minute, was I pulled into gazing at something? Was I unkind to someone? Did I backbite? Think to yourself. And here, Tawbah kicks in again. Long and that. And the Tawbah will also hear guys with a great backup plan. You know that extra savings account that you open and you forget about it, whenever you have extra money, you just put it in there and you leave it? You don't think about it? That's your nawaf, your sunnah, your extra things that you do, right? People on the Day of Judgment come with mountains of good deeds. Mountains of good deeds. But because they were not on top of their game, they were not holding themselves to account on a daily person. This person takes from you, and that person takes from you, and this and that, until you find yourself, God forbid, bankrupt. And all you did from Salah and Zakan, worshiping and this and that, is gone. And this is why Sayyidina Umar radiallahu says what? Hasibu anfusukum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourself to account before you are held to account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Deep of the nest. And one of the um, the the the, uh, the, the tabi'in who lived in the time of Sayyidina Umar, his name was Al Ahnaf ibn Qais. Don't do this at home, all right? Don't burn yourselves. But he used to do this. He used to go near his lamp and put his hand near the fire so he could feel it. And once it would heat up, he would tell himself, Oh, Hanais, what made you do so and so on that day? And what made you do so and so on that day? That was their level of holding themselves to account. Alright? So step one, Toba. Step two, self monitoring. Step three is self account. The last step, or the fourth practical step I'm going to tell you is Adab Mujahadat in Nafs. Self striving or restraining. And before we jump into this, you have to understand it's very easy and possible for one to go from one type of nest to the other type of nest in a matter of minutes, if not seconds, for both. You should never ever let Shaitan make you think that that's who you are and what you're going to change. Because that's what he's great at doing, right? Depressing you, getting in your head. There's no point. But that's who you are, right? Or that your nest is harsh, and that your heart is hard, and that your eyes will never tear. Or that you're going to need years to change. You can't just change it once. Guys, we all came from the same origin, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nafs wa And all these qualities are already built in. You know when you buy like a, whatever, something, a computer, built-in camera, built-in? These good qualities are already built in, in you. You just have to put the effort. You have to put the effort. And you have to do what you have to do next. And self-restrain yourself. And I'm not just saying that about changing from one nest to the other. Look at the Qur'an, right? If you look at the story of Qur'an, and the magicians come, with what kind of anfus did they have? What kind of anfus? You guys fall asleep for me. Were you up on my partying? Come on. <laughs> I heard about what was going on, right? <laughs> so they, they had what? Like, nafs what? Amar of Asul. How much are you going to pay us for Qur'an if we beat Musa for you? And a minute later, Sayyidina Musa alayhi throws the snake on the ground, eats their snakes, and they fall down with anfus mutma'inna in sujood. In a minute, from anfus amara to anfus mutma'inna, you can change. It takes a moment of truth, Allah. One minute of truth. Just hold yourself. Be strong. And then another story that I love about self-restraining, or how nafs can change. The day Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa opened Mecca, and he entered and he told what the people of Quraysh, Idhabu antum tulaqab, go, you are what, you are free, I have forgiven you. Halas, after all the oppression and all they did to you, Rasulullah has go, you are free, Idhabu antum tulaqab. Amongst these people of Quraysh was a man called what, Fudara. 
And imagine somebody just let you off the hook, right? You were killing these people, persecuting them, and then say the harm is of Allah, still here to go. You should feel what? Grateful. How did I let us go? But Fadala had a very hard nafs, a very harsh nafs. And he decided that he's going to kill Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi And he goes and he grabs a dagger, hides it inside his cloak. And he waits for Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the first wants to walk. And he starts following him until he gets closer and closer, trying to get the right chance. And Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends him behind him. So he turned around and he said, what is your nafs telling you to do, Ya Fudala? He said, I'm not doing anything, I'm doing dhikr of Allah. So Fudala says, Sayyidina Muhammad raised his hand and he said, I thought he was going to beat me. Instead, he put his hand on my chest and he started rubbing it on it and saying, what? Istaghfirullah, Ya Fudala. Ask Allah for forgiveness, Ya Fudala. Ask Allah for repentance, Ya Fudala. And Fudala says, Wallahi, before he put his hands on my chest, he was the most detested person to my heart on earth. And after he lifted his hand off my chest, he was the most beloved person on earth to my heart. Is this the same nafs of Fudal who was going to kill a second ago? You see how it can change? A moment of truth. Just open up your hearts. And subhanAllah, sometimes I feel we fail in mujahadat and nafs because we don't want to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promises to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا نَهْيَ لَهُمْ سُبْلَنَا And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. It's a done deal. When Allah promises something, He does not take it back. It's not like when you were a little kid and somebody said, Oh, come, 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 I'll give you a candy. And then you come and you, and you get put to bed or something, right? No. If Allah says He's going to give you something, it's a done deal. There is no questioning. We just don't trust Allah enough. We don't have haqq wa on Him. If you strive, I will guide you to my way. I will help you. Take the first step and I will help you. But how do I know it's my nafs or it's shaitan? Right? A lot of times we put the blame on. I sometimes I feel bad for shaitan. I'm like, oh, shaitan did this to me, and shaitan did that to me. Hold on, hold on. Time out, time out. All right. So, if it's your nafs, it is something that will keep what insisting and coming back to you. Shaitan, all he cares about is pulling you down. He doesn't care how. So he'll come and whisper to you something. Do so and so. If you comply with him, well, fine, he'll keep you going in it. If you don't comply with him, what is he going to do? He'll turn to another idea. He's not a fool. He's smart. He wants to make sure you fall. It doesn't matter how, as long as you fall. Your nafs, you're going to know it's you when something comes and whispers to you, do this. And you're like, no, no, no. And then two days later, no, no, no. I want this. No, no. I want this one. That's when you know it's your nafs. And that's when you know you really need to do jihad. And surround your thing, yourself with things that will help you stop from doing the something. Right? If you have a specific something you're struggling with, see what are the things that lead to it. What makes you do this? And help yourself. Surround yourself with good people, with suhba salaha. MashaAllah, look at you guys. You all are beautiful. MashaAllah, you have such beautiful souls. Surround yourself with good support. Be good friends to one another. Be a good suhba. Have someone you can rely on that will give you advice, that will pull you up, not down. Wallahi, no one will help us when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your best friend who's telling you, let's go do so and so, that's not correct, is not going to be there on the Day of Judgment. He's not going to help you. She's not going to help you. Have someone who's going to help you up, and then you can help somebody else up, and it becomes a chain. We pull each other up. So, quickly to recap, four types of anfus, nafs, amal of su, nafs, what? Lawama, nafs, mutma'inna, and nafs, ghafila. And four types of methods we can attain what the adab of our nafs. We said what tawbah, we said self monitoring, adab muraqabat al nafs, self accounting, adab muhasabat al nafs, and the last thing is what self striving or adab mujahadat al nafs. And I'm sorry, but I can't picture talking about adab and not hitting on social media. Yes. If we know social media, what kind of an impact it has, not just on our spirituality, but also on our mental health, whether we want to admit it or not, how well 
balanced of a human being can you be when you're pulled into a million different directions? Trying to keep up with the insanely fast pace of, sorry to say, a fake world. It is fake. Well, love is fake. How many of us have Facebook? I'll put those hands up. I have a Facebook. I'm live actually on Facebook right now. <laughs> For good reason, okay? Okay, very good. Okay, how many of you have Instagram? Okay. How about Twitter? I don't have Twitter. How about Snapchat? Filters. Okay, beautiful. Now, don't you raise your hand for this coming part. I'm not going to put you on the spot. How many of you guys are actually using these apps for a good cause? Don't answer me. Don't put up your hands. <laughs> Unless you feel like it. You're like, uh, about that. Um, right? Okay. Just think to yourself. I want you honestly, guys, listen. For one second, think to yourself. What do you spend most of your time doing on these applications? Just think for one second. I'm going to let you think of this for one second. Be honest with yourself. When you go on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, I don't know if there's anything else you guys use, what we do in the US. What do you spend most of your time doing on these applications? Are you inspiring others? Are you maybe sharing beneficial knowledge? Are you bringing awareness to a certain cause or situation happening across the world that people don't know of? <coughs> or, yes, or, are you just browsing through people's profiles, allowing your nest to wish it had a vacation like this person and muscles like that guy, and a husband like this blogger whose husband bought her, I don't know what kind of car, and wrapped it in this big, huge red ribbon. <laughs> Were you posting pictures of yourselves a hundred times a day? I checked into here, I checked into here. I'm like, I'm honestly about the thing next thing I'm expecting, I checked into the back. Okay, great. What is this going to do for me? Like, okay, you're drinking coffee here, you came out of there, okay, wonderful. And then what? Or are you getting into ridiculous arguments in the comment section? Not following the adab of conversation and realizing that these are real people, humans you're attacking on the other side of the screen. And it's not just a keyboard that you're letting out your anger and frustration on. And if you are, did you ever think what you're actually doing to your nest during this whole process? While you're clicking here and posting there and following this and doing this and that? What's happening to you spiritually and mentally? And what's happening to your guidelines as a Muslim, I'll tell you what's happening. You are slowly shifting from following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidelines and the adab that he set for us to guidelines and adab mannerisms that have been set by human beings just like you and me. You need to look like this to be accepted. You need to be dressed like this to be fashionable. Girls, the turban looks cuter. Forget about that jab. And the front part has to show. That's what this fashionista vlogger said. Your triceps have to be the size and this one to be a good looking guy. Who said that? Oh, the boys are laughing up there. I see you. <laughs> so go, let me hide my muscles now. Who said? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or people said? Who put these guidelines? Allah or those people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. And He knows how you best function. And the more you try to follow human guidelines and try to please the creation, the more you're going to stray away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidelines. And you're going to wear out your nafs and your mind. He made you and He knows that these things will harm your mind and your nafs Allah. You'll find yourself competing in an unreal world, thinking that the more likes I get, the happier I'll be. True or false? True? Yeah, sometimes it takes a, it gets to us sometimes, right? Great, you got a hundred likes, a thousand likes today, and I felt awesome. How long did this happen last for, honestly? And how real was it? Guess what? Next morning you wake up and you only got 50 likes. What happens to you? You start feeling anxious. You have the urge to post. Right? I need to post something. And with some people, it reaches the point of depression. 
How many people have you heard about committing suicide because of social media? Right? Or appearing to be something they're not? Because you feel you're just not good enough. You don't have those great pits or travel to these amazing places and those amazing experiences that posted about them. So you're simply not good enough. But who are you not good enough to? To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to these people that you actually call friends? And they're not friends. They're just people you don't even know. If they met you on the street, they wouldn't even recognize you. You have to pull yourself from these distractions. You have to be aware of what you're doing and what's being done to you by this little device. If you're not using it correctly, I'm not saying you can use it, but you have to be smart. A Muslim can use fatal. You have to think, what, what am I doing? Right? And you have to also understand not everything you see is what's really there. People will only make you see what they want you to see. Right? There's no perfection. Nobody has, nobody wakes up in the morning looking like they're going to, I don't know what party, right? We all wake up with messy hair and puffy eyes and we all sometimes have messy homes and we sometimes cry, we sometimes laugh. We're human beings. It's such a deceptive world. And I remember, subhanAllah, so a couple of months ago, I posted somebody, um, I think it was my sister, she shared with me um, this little clip of Masjid al and there was like a thunderstorm and lightning. So I, I shared it on Instagram. And I was like thinking to ask you know, for ox and whatnot. And then I'm sitting and my friend texts me a few minutes later and she's like, you know, oh, mashallah, please keep us in your du'a. And when you come back, let me know. And I'm like, I'm like, from where? I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, are you in Aqsa? I'm like, I'm on my couch in my pajamas, mismatched, but stop sitting watching you, whatever, with my kids. I'm not in Aqsa. So not everything you see, we assume things, subhanAllah, it's like our mind thinks like there's this perfection. People are going places, doing things. You could be not posting and doing amazing things, wallahi. And your nafs is going to be so much more at rest and at peace. People don't need to know what you're doing for you to be great. You can be great between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So please, please don't get sucked into this black hole, into posting things, just to feed your ego and your nafs. And just to be accepted, be mindful what you post. Don't post things just so that people like it. Okay? The Prophet said what? A true believer is not involved in taunting or frequently cursing others or in any indecency or abusing. And so I'll be honest with you, when, when I post some of the videos, I get a lot of comments in the section, right? And some of them are, mashallah, well, I don't even deserve them. So sweet, people are so nice. Some of them, ya latif. <laughs> man, oh man, I'm serious. And by the way, I get comments from Muslims and non-Muslims, and some of the non-Muslims are really, really sweet, right? And some of them, you know, they try to call me to Christianity, or some of them are trying to convince me that, you know, I should believe in Sayyidina Isa, and I'm like, um, I believe in Sayyidina Isa, my son's name is Isa, Isa Muhammad, right? So, but the comments I sometimes get from the Muslim brothers, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about you guys, the Muslims, yeah, it's usually from the brothers, I don't know why, what have I done? Um, SubhanAllah, it hurts. And it doesn't hurt because of what they're saying, but it hurts that this has become the state of our ummah. We don't even realize the adab of conversation when we're talking with other people. We don't realize it's a real human being. It could be someone's dad or someone's son, someone's mother or sister that you're talking to on the other side. It's the state of our ummah. Wallahi, it's sad. We might not agree together on something, right? We might not agree with something I'm saying. Or might not agree with something you're saying. We still have to respect one another. And we have to listen to one another. And we still have to stay together. It's okay. It's okay if we disagree. But with Adam. And we have lost that Adam. SubhanAllah. And I'm going to end today because I now have, have a flight to catch. Unfortunately. It's so sweet. Like, it's SubhanAllah. It's bittersweet. Like, you know, I miss my kids, but you guys were so, so amazing and so inspiring, mashallah. And. It's a personal story. I haven't shared it with anybody with this like public yet. And I was a bit hesitant to share it or not. And I don't want the guys to zone up because it has to do with makeup. But listen to the idea of it, okay? Um, girls, it's the idea the concept and girls listen. All of you. Anyway, so. Um, so in my family, you can inherit one of two facial features. Either the beautiful green eyes, which I apparently don't have, or you get black halos under your eyes. I got the latter. My sister got the first. <laughs> so. I would walk out and subhanAllah people would tell me, oh my God, are you sick? Are you okay? Oh my God, have you been crying? 
I did not cry, I'm not sick, I didn't fight with anybody. This is just how I look, right? And kind of all, after a while, it got to my head. And the magic word was what? Concealer. Yes, you know what I'm saying, right? A little magic stick, okay, I lost it, like it over gone. And after a while, the weight of concealer doesn't look right, so I think it needs some blush and a little bit of mascara just to look like my face is natural. And I'm not talking about contouring, right? Because that is pure deception. That is Khadiyah. You marry someone, you wake up in the morning, you're like, where is my wife? Well, have you guys watched these contouring tutorials in Japan or China? I'm like, yeah, how are you? Like, why? Why would you do that to yourself? I was reading the other day about, I think it was in the Indian Some guy married someone and woke up in the morning. Yeah, she divorced her and he sued her for deception. It's like, that's not who I married. SubhanAllah. So just something like where you just look like you're not sick, right? And inside of me, I knew I was wrong. But I listened to my nephews. And I kept telling me, it's just a little bit, it's okay. It's not something where, you know, it's fit now or anyone's making me look beautiful. But I just don't look tired. Went on for days. Until last year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited us to his house for Hajj. Right? And before we leave, they told us, you know, it's smart to have two of everything, right? So have your passport and then a copy of your passport and put them in two bags, right? So if you whatever, you close in this bag and that bag, one credit card and one credit card there. So if you lose one thing, you're not up in the air. And of course, with my weakness at that time, first thing I thought, oh my god, a concealer. I ordered another one. And I had two pouches, subhanAllah, the way I was thinking. I put one in this pouch and one in that pouch. And I'm going to hide stuff for a while. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, but that's how I was. That's where my nest was at that time. I put one in this pouch and one in that pouch, right, as a backup. And of course, two months before Hajj, the amount of tests and trials Allah put me through, and everybody was telling me, you can't go. You're so sick. Even my doctor was like, you're not going to go like this. You're very ill and my paperwork, and then my pet, like everything was saying I was not going. Until the morning of August 15, 2018 came. The day we're actually gonna leave. And I had everything ready, my white guard and my pillow. And of course my makeup pouch was there on the counter. <laughs> I know, so bad. So I woke up in the morning, we got into Ihram, and I'm thinking to myself of everything I went through, and. And I still couldn't believe I was going to go. Like, I had such issues with my passport. And, you know, I had to travel, and they wanted my passport, but they wouldn't issue a secondary passport. And I went to Egypt. They said, yeah, we will send it back. It will take four weeks. I'm like, but they need it tomorrow. Isn't that what DHL is? Like, well, that's what the rules are. And everything, subhanAllah, was just not working out. And now I was actually in my white bar. And I looked at myself in the mirror, and I came to lift my hand. I couldn't do it. I was like... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting me to his house and I'm going to start by disobeying him? I said no. And I quickly just put the pouch in the back and I'm like, no, no, I, I can't do this. Not promising anything that I'm not going to put on makeup again, right? I shoved in the suitcase and we headed off to Mecca, arrived there and I was just in disbelief. I couldn't believe I actually made it there. We got there, we made our umrah, spent a couple of days, and said, alhamdulillah, no makeup. And then they told us, now we're going to go to Mina. Right, pack up whatever you need for the coming five days. And whatever you pack in the other bags is going to be going to Medina, you will not have access to it. And for the first time, I said no to my nurse. I zipped those two bags and I put them into my suitcase that was going to Medina. And alhamdulillah, they've been zipped since that day underneath my bathroom sink. The tired look that I always used to see. I know it's probably still there, and I still have I, I don't see it. I don't even think about it. When I'm looking at the mirror, sometimes I catch myself not realizing that I'm not focusing on that. And I say, Alhamdulillah. When you restrain yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wallahi, Wallahi, will recompensate you in ways you will never imagine. I love giving da'wah. And I love inspiring people and sharing stories. And I've always been teaching all my life, right? Islamic studies, Islamic history, all the way from fifth grade to high schoolers, teaching in the masjid. I just love it. It's something I love to do. 
And before I went to Hajj for the longest time, I would make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would open doors for me where I would have a bigger platform and reach more people and share his message. And inside of me, I knew, I would ask myself, why is it not happening? Is it because it's not good for me? Or is it because of something wrong that I am doing? That's what I'm going to And wallahi, the day I said no to my nafs, the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened these doors for me. And my proof is that I am standing here today in Birmingham talking to you about Adam of the Nafs. I'd like to close with you with the dua because I really have to leave, although I don't want to leave. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the adab of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to restrain our anfus. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sustain us with anfus mutma'inna ya Rabb and never ever make us from the ghafili. May we ya Rabbi be from those who come on the day of judgment adorned with the most beautiful of manners making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger proud of us saying this is my ummah. This is my ummah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.